is joining me in welcoming Chris Parker. They're comfy. Now you're about to sit on your microphone, so you might need to. You're sitting on your microphone. <laughs> it's be very embarrassing. <laughs> what a way to start. <laughs> that was the chair, by the way. <laughs> well, hi, doll. Hello. How are you? Very good, thank you. So, this is not your first time in Ireland, but how are you enjoying your first Dublin Comic Con? Um, this is the most wonderful Comic Con there is in the whole world, I think, is the correct answer to say. Um, it's fantastic. I coached him well. <laughs> this is what, the, the fifth or sixth, seventh year? Ninth. Ninth! My God. Oh, yeah. Note to everybody we're 10 years old next year. Who's Who's been for the nine? Who's done all of them? <gasps> Some diehard fans here. That's fantastic. Will you be here next year? Yes! Um, that's incredible. Yeah. I think I, the first one of these I did was, not, not in Dublin, but the first kind of convention-y was 20, 20 years ago this year. It was the Lord of the Rings one, wasn't it? It was the Lord of the Rings one before the movies had even come out. And um, my friend Mark Ferguson, who is Gilgalad, who's the boss elf, and, and he literally is, is in the movie for half a frame. You see him grabbed by Sauron, rawr, boom, burst into flame, dead. Um, but he, he shot a lot more, and he's, you know, he's Gilgalad. And we both got invited um, by Dirk, who, runs, who ran FedCon, which was a Star Wars-y show, uh, Star Trek. And, um, and we both, the movie hadn't come out. We were like... What is this thing? We didn't know. And so we we went and we just had the most amazing time. And I didn't know what conventions were. I didn't know the level of craziness that there was in conventions and just the joy of it was um so that was it'll be our 20th anniversary um this year. I know it's crazy and with conventions and everything like I remember we chatted before the the show kicked off and you were so passionate talking about just how much you actually just love doing these types of shows. And there was a, a phrase that I've actually, I'm definitely going to be coining, which is like, you got to let your inner geek roar. Like, come on, how good is that? But like, that is the thing. It's just, you just sort of dive in and you, you get involved and you're just sort of like, this is great fun. Yeah. Well, it's, it's um, why I ended up doing this. It's that when, when I was a kid, it's, you know, dressing up and make believe and telling stories. And, and I was very fortunate. My, my mother was a, had been a kindergarten teacher. So as a kid, they, both my mother and father, they would read to us and we always had books and we, we had, you know, drawing. And so that, that magic of when you're a child and you're allowed to just really be creative and, and make believe and it's real and you know it's pretend but it's still real and and then as we get older we're told that you know stop doing that that's silly do something real and um fortunately I kind of managed to find a way to keep doing the pretend and I remember telling my parents um that I was going to be an actor when I was about 15 and they were just devastated they were like oh god <laughs> he's gonna live at home until he's 50. Um, but I suppose because like you, you were saying to me the other day, you were actually born in Fiji and then you moved to New Zealand when you were young. Yeah. So you kind of hail from two very like rugby minded countries, so to speak. So like was, was rugby ever big in your life? No, I was useless at rugby. I just couldn't. <laughs> That's, I actually, I did um, in third form, which do you have forms here? Uh, we say like uh, class and then it's like year. So like secondary school will be first year, second year, and then it's first class. So if you're in So secondary form, is when you're like 11, 12? Yeah, 12 up is secondary right. school. So um, it's whatever that, that beginning of high school is. So we, we would have primary school, intermediate, which is two years when you're 10 and 11 or 11 and 12 or something. And then um, 13 to 17, 18 was high school. So I, I don't know. So it was my third form, which is like, I think I was all of 12 or 13. And there was PE, which sport, and then there was a drama class. And the drama class was only about five of us. So they just scheduled it at the same time as PE. 
So it was my great way to escape having to do sport, which generally in those days, I think it's got better, but back, um, back when I was a kid, that PE teachers generally were kind of angry, violent, monstrous creatures who liked hurting children. And so PE would just be like, run round the block, jump. And you know, they just shouted at you. And if you weren't particularly brilliant at sport, then it was just a nightmare. So I discovered that I could go and do drama where you just got to dress up and be silly. <laughs> and that got me out of PE. So that's really why I do the job I do now. And were you still based in New Zealand when, you know, one Peter Jackson sort of came to town and was starting? Well, to... he, he was in town already because yeah. he comes from there. But, um... but when he, So when he was setting up, because I heard... Now, this may or may not be true, but did you actually get involved before getting cast? Yes. Because you were I, actually um, doing we, the storyboard stuff, wasn't it? When, when the Lord of the Rings was first going to happen, um, it was going to be with Miramax, and they wanted two films. They didn't want to do three. And so two scripts were made. So the, the, it was you know cut halfway through um, Return of the King. And... We, uh, we, we, there were a group of us, we got together. So there was maybe 12 of us and we all went down to Wellington where Peter was based and we l stayed in a recording studio for two weeks, I think we were down there. And we just did a, a radio play of these, these scripts. And so we got, I think I played, um, I got to play Frodo, Legolas, um, various other characters and and so we all got to play a few characters and we we you know we it, when, every time a new character came in or there was a monster or something we'd all be going oh what if it sounds like this they didn't go with that one they went that's just bad yoda that's not clever at all but um so yeah so we got to record the two films and this was going to be used to um in in with films particularly, sometimes they make a thing called an animatic, which is the storyboard, which is like a cartoon version of what you're going to see. And then it's animated. On this, they were animating it slightly, and the, the, we would do the script over. So they could then show it to the Americans and go, this is what it looks like. Um, so previs or, or previsualization or animatic. So we did that, and then... Peter, Fran, and Philippa had always wanted to do the three books as three films, not the two. And the deal, Miramax went away, and then New Line or Fine Line came in. And so they were then allowed to do the three movies, which was great for us because we got to go back to studio and then do all three again. So um, it was an amazing, it was a really fun time. None of us, you know, we knew it was going to be pretty cool, but none of us, well, I didn't anyway, realize just how just ridiculous the films were going to be and, and how it was the first time I got a glimpse of how much people loved these films because already the internet was reasonably new and you know it'd been around for a bit but but it as a tool of communication was reasonably new so there was a group one ring net and they they were you know they were angry at the beginning they were like don't you screw up this this is our book we'll kill you and Peter very wisely went, I get it, because it's his book too. And, and they were, they read that book, so, those books so many times. And they, they were still reading them as we were shooting because they would alter things or they'd have an idea. And so they were true, they are true geek fans. So when they were putting this together, it, it was the same intent. They just had this amazing arsenal of films to make it. So very quickly, Peter rather than fending off at onering.net and, and you know, these strangers on the internet, he went, come on in. Let me share what I can share, and some things will be secret, but, but let me assure you, because you are the people who are going to come and watch it, hopefully, that I am making this with the best intent, and, or we are making this with the best intent. And, and I really think they did. I think that shows when you watch it. It's, they, love, they love these stories as much as everyone else does, so it's, um, it's beautiful, I love. Yeah, when people are passionate about something, it definitely like comes across in, in their work. And I'd say for you, were you expecting then once they were actually starting to shoot, you were kind of just like, hey, <clears throat> you know, like, give me a call, like, let me know <coughs> what's going on. Um, because like you ha you were technically voicing Frodo already. So were you kind of just well, like, I, 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 you know, I should have played Frodo, that. obviously. I mean, Elijah Wood. 
<laughs> Little Elijah. Um, he's the best. Uh, yeah, I think, I don't know. It's, it's, New Zealand is very small. New Zealand, how many people live in, in Republic of Ireland? Five million. Five million. Is, is that in the Republic or is that in Ireland total? In the public. Because, yeah, New Zealand, New Zealand's five million. And so we all kind of know each other. And, and when you grow up in the industry there, you, you work with everyone. So you just kind of have this assumption that you're going to be in everything because there's only so many people to go around. So, it's, so whatever show comes to town, it's like, oh, what are you going to be in it? Oh, I'll be this or that. So um, I, I think probably my arrogance at the time just totally expected to be in it. But... Um, I, I was thrilled because there's, you know, there's, there's not a lot of New Zealanders mm -hmm. in it, and you know, it's a, it's, it was a brief and wonderful thing to be involved with, and um, and just the the joy of doing it at the time was great. But the the thing that does blow me away still is 20 years later, I'm meeting people who just love the books and love the story and love the films, and and it's it's a great way to be part of the kind of the crazy crazy <laughs> madness that is. Um, this world, which is lovely. Yeah, and I know it's like even with like the the character himself, who's in a couple of scenes, and especially to say in in the two towers, you know, a very iconic moment. I'm which assuming. isn't in the book, apparently. No, it, yeah, that's what was I was going to say. There apparently was a day um, at lunch. The the how the guy I play, Hal Deer, is um, gets killed at uh, Helm's Deep, yeah. and and we were at lunch one day because because a lot of the shooting was like through it. They were still just reworking. They would const They never stopped working. And sometimes, you know, script changes would come that day, but often subtle. And then at lunch one day, Philippa uh, Boyens came up and went, "Hey, Peter wants to kill you." <laughs> and it was just, "Oh God, what have I done?" But um, and and then said, "Look, we just we just want we want to, we want to represent death and loss because at the moment there's a big battle, but." We need, you know, and we can't kill Vigo. I was going, kill Vigo, let me take over. I'd be great. Oh, little Elijah, I've done him before. I can do him again. Legolas, wicked. You know, not that hard. And um, so, so, yeah, they, they, wanted, they wanted the moment of, of an immortal dying and, and sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. So for me, it was the most wonderful thing because it just meant I got to go back and play a lot more and, and experience the... The horror that was the shooting of Helm's Deep, but I would just come and go, so I kind of had it easy. But the the full crew that that shot that sequence, um, John McAfee, who was the second unit director, shot three months outside in winter, which is kind of like a winter here, just wet and cold, um, by the harbour in an old quarry. So the the wind would come, the Arctic wind would come from Antarctica, Antarctic wind. And you know, there'd be fake rain and there'd be real rain and, and just everyone. And everyone working at night. So people would sleep through the day, work all night, go home and sleep again. So everyone went crazy. And it was three months of cold night winter shooting where I would just come in for a week and go, oh, this is nice. Hi, everyone. Bye. And disappear again. But, um, but didn't yeah. you have to sit in the makeup chair for quite a while? Because didn't the wig take a while to be applied on? Or... Yeah, you got any show when you start, um, especially if you have prosthetics or wigs, it, it's you know it's going to take five hours every day, and then it gradually gets gets quicker. The reason, like I, I love tattoos. I think tattoos are the coolest thing, and if you can have a sleeve of tattoos, you're like the coolest. But anything like that for an actor means a, potentially another hour in the makeup chair in the morning, and. When your call is going to be 4.30 in the morning, which means you have to get up at 3, or if you're traveling, it's further. You just want every moment of sleep. And your makeup artist is just going to hate you. And so when they're doing your eye, they're going to be going... <laughs> <laughs> so you, you kind of want to give them every opportunity. So what, what tends to happen is this, the process speeds up, and then you can whack it out in half an hour. But it's also a really lovely beginning to the day that you... Um, it's, you know, you have a coffee and it's, it's where you gossip and, and the buses, makeup buses usually have, you know, four to six seats going down. So there's people beside you and everyone kind of has a catch up. Sorry, I'm burping. I just had lunch. Very rude. Um, and also with, with rings, the, um, 
there was a fair amount of studio work, but there were a lot of real locations. And quite often you'd be, you'd be in a hotel somewhere, you'd be picked up in the dark in the morning, driven maybe for an hour, sometimes you get in a helicopter, it's very cool, and dropped off in the dark somewhere, and you're in a, a base camp with a whole lot of trucks and trailers and things, and you get taken into wardrobe or makeup or, or your trailer and you get changed. So it's all dark and you're just seeing your buddies and friends. And then once you're done, they go, right, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll block in half an hour or something. You step out the door and you're on top of the mountain or you're in the most beautiful forest or you're beside the sea or these incredible spaces that a, a lot of locations weren't publicly available anyway so you couldn't get to these spaces so for us it was just like every morning was like god i'm here and you'd often have no idea you know what you were going to see when you stepped out the door so that was an incredibly cool bonus we are, i'm just thinking ireland and, and new zealand are so similar in so many ways mm -hmm. and um we we have a slightly warmer north you do, do you have any sort of is there any sort of tropically bits here not right now. No. <laughs> Who am I kidding? <laughs> that's, that's what sort of New Zealand, those of you in New Zealand is, you know, way down in, in the south, uh, south southern hemisphere. And it's long and thin. I think it's, the, I think it's even longer than uh, all of the UK. Yeah, I think, I think that is true. And, and at the top, there's kind of, because it's flip side. So the north is sunnier and then down south is the Antarctic, basically. <laughs> And this is not. This is more. A, this is a Scottish thing than Irish. But various people, you know, various kind of colonial settlers came through. But there's a place, Dunedin, which is down south, and with the boats coming through, there must have been a Scottish boat that was coming up, going, "Hey, where are we going to stay? Do we stay here where it's nice and sunny? Look at this. Oh, and beaches, white sand. That's nice, isn't it? Keep going." Oh, rolling hills, green, nice, nice. No, go down, further down, further down. Oh, look, black rock, gorse, <laughs> heather, storms, freezing cold, Arctic winds. Let's live there. So they all move. So the Scots are all down in this really crappy bit of New Zealand that's freezing cold. And um, we shot a fair amount down there. But um, it looks great, but you don't want to live there. But, um, but yeah. But, but, but in the sense of lo like, uh, ridiculous locations that Ireland has that you can drive for half an hour and everything is different and mm. it's just, it's so astoundingly beautiful. Yeah, because okay, so even when you were filming here for rain, you were actually based in what is actually a, an area which is known for its rain is actually over in Galway and Connemara and things like that. So, because that was is where- that the castle bit? That's where Ashford Castle is based. So you actually- No, we-, we I didn't know you lived in Ashford Castle while you were filming as well. We-, we Show Rain, which was um, the French royal family in the 1500s, and the French castle was obviously shot in Ireland. <laughs> and so between here and um, uh, starts with S airports, there, Shannon, um, there is this castle Ashford, and it's beautiful. It's an incredible castle. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the first season they used it, they established it, and it was all a bit crap inside, it run down and. But then it was bought and renovated. So when I joined second season um, and we turn up and it's just, it's so beautiful inside. It's full posh loveliness. It's one of like the, the most popular five-star hotels in all of Europe. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, it's, we were talking about this. There's a lot of castle hotels or, <laughs> you know, manor houses that you get and you go, this is like my aunt's terrible basement. It's, it smells of mold and it's horrible. But this was real flat. So we filmed there, but we also got the most perfect weather for two weeks. It was just blue skies and flawless. And then the next year came back and we didn't shoot at the castle. And we, we were based in Dublin and we were shooting on the Guinness Estate. There is a, there's a beach somewhere. Does anyone? I, I'm and in terrible Wicklow with near, there's like so the rolling hills. And it's like an hour Guinness out Lake. and there's amazing like down cliffs and down to this beach and and we were doing a shipwreck scene. So we were suddenly we were just drenched in seawater, freezing cold. The executive producer's there and go, how are we going to do the soaky? He's just, just going to get a bucket. <laughs> and they just chuck water on us. And we spend a good two weeks just covered in water and sand. It's the coldest I've ever been. It's dirty old Irish freezing winter. 
And, and so we're on the beach soaking wet, and then we're up a hill soaking wet. And you get there, and because you have to match the beach where you've just been washed up, they throw another bucket of water on you. And, and we were, the, one of the giant Guinness estates, and this huge house, it's beautiful. But you couldn't see any of it because it was dirty Irish winter. So we're in this amazing location, but all you see is gray and you know, rain coming this way and sleet and snow. So, so the second time wasn't quite as glamorous, but... Um, I love how you just mentioned how the rain was coming this oh, way, because I always remember um, Josh Hartnett was saying that when he filmed Penny Dreadful here, one of the things that he actually remembered most about Ireland was the sideways rain. Well, it's great because it <laughs> sneaks under the umbrella. It's very smart rain. Whatever you use to protect... But, um, but we, we, because we were staying here in Dublin... Strangely, we didn't mind because we just would come back to the hotel and then go, right, let's go out. And, and we brought, we would shoot in Canada. So we brought over um, not a huge um, Canadian crew because we got fantastic crews here, but maybe there were about 20 of us. And that show, we had all, it was such a family, like we just, it was a great show. We just adored each other. And the, so it was basically 20 mates going out, being miserable and cold in the day and then coming back into Dublin. And, of course, we would go out. And the, the Canadian crew were just so enamored with Guinness. And, you know, you hear this all the time, but people get here go, it's not like Guinness everywhere else. <laughs> and so right they're it. just chugging it back. But what happens with Guinness if you're not used to it? And they're just farting like monsters. So you're doing a scene. And then even out on a hill, and then this waft just drifts over. And it's like, stop it! And they just, every night, 15 Guinnesses, the next day on set. <laughs> dreadful. So I just, I'm sure if you're Irish, you don't do that because you're just. Uh, no, they do. <laughs> civilized, civilized, fine, wonderful people. But, um, but yeah, it was, uh, sorry, I'm just ranting but it's a really it's okay. you can rant away this is your panel <laughs> <laughs> it was a very 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 good time when i was looking at your resume actually it is so varied but one thing that did strike strike me was that there was a lot of roles that you've taken that actually just have such elaborate like costumes and things like that including of course spartacus like glabber yes he had like the same sort of outfit like so you weren't really changing often but it was still like no it's it dirty, was elaborate, same though. old same old often Actually, this, this happens a lot, which you might have picked up in, in a lot of fantasy stuff. The characters never change. You think Lord of the Rings, they mm -hmm. never washed. Those cut, they would have stunk. <laughs> Dirty, <laughs> filthy hobbits. And, <laughs> ugh. And, and I, I did a show, Legend of the Seeker, and I was emperor of all the mm. world. I was richer than God. I just had one frock yep. every day. Sometimes I'd take it off. Sometimes, and I also... Uh, you hopefully never saw it in the show, but you know, I it's amazing, beautiful costume. But and I thought, oh, there'll be some great boots or something really comfortable underneath. I we I had Bidna shoes. What you know, like number one shoe warehouse? Do you have something like that? Like the, the crappy place where you can buy really cheap shoes, but they look great, but they not very comfortable. These were like a pair of terrible, just black. First, day, first job you have, you buy yourself a $20 pair of shoes, and it's like, oh, look, they're nice. You're like describing the shoes I wore yesterday. <laughs> the what? The shoes I wore yesterday, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, but it, was, it was just, it was the silly thing. You have this fabulous costume, and then pull it up, and there's just a pair of black socks and a, like an accountant's pair of shoes underneath. Sorry if there's any accountants or shoe salesmen who work at Number One Shoe Warehouse. But we, we also, the, the, going on about body smells um thing i used to love doing is because with glabber had uh, in spartacus there was a underneath you where the romans would have like a little cotton like like a mini dress like a night a nighty and and then it was a leather breastplate um strapped on top and it would just it would get so sweaty and disgusting but if you did if you sort of sucked in like that and I would do this at the end of the day, and I'd choose a different member of the crew every day to do it. <laughs> they loved me. Uh, <laughs> and if you sort of suck all this in, hold here, and this is all solid. This is just a plate. Walk up to someone and go, hey. And as they come up, go, hey. <laughs> and it would blast 
fetid, dirty, sweaty belly air up into their face. They really loved me. They thought I was so funny. Um, so that was my... I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk, you see. I should not share these things. I'm sorry I think you're quite the trickster on set now. <laughs> well, it's, you know, you've got to keep. Um, that, that is one of the, the great joys of, of th this job is you get to, you get to just play and, and cruise. A, I always describe it as, as, you know, carny folk. We are, the, the most joyful bit is, is the being on set. So you... You know, hopefully the job is stimulating and wonderful, but being part of that kind of carnival group is, and you, you just, you love the people you work with. We all get very good at intimate, intimate, intimate relationships where we all just know everything. And then being really good at going, thanks, see you on the next one, or, you know, see you the next time. But, but though I just adore those kind of relationships. And they, they have to put up with you. If you're an actor, they have to put up with you. <laughs> so you can, <laughs> if they fart at you, you can send your belly air at them. That's what I feel. It's all fair and games. It's all fair games. So. Um, with Glabber, you just seemed to relish playing such a, uh, careful of my phrasing here. <laughs> <laughs> There's some children here. It's such a, such a, a baddie, shall we say. What a very, very baddie he was. Um, yeah, it's, it's lovely. Often, um, often when you're, you're sort of you know putting a character together, there's a whole various people are involved. Obviously, you start with the script, and but there is there is kind of a, a world building that happens when you begin a show. That it's it's the weird thing where you're trying to get everyone onto the same to share a same vision that you can. Every every world, even if it's set now in supposedly the real, still has to be created collectively to, to sort of sell the story. So, the, and often if you're playing someone who does terrible things or whatever, you, the actor part of you and, and for the benefit of the show and for you keeping your job, you need to kind of go, how can I make them love me? How can I win them over? So you'll often, you know, actors are often going, I'm bad, I'm bad, but look, my heart is it. Please love me. And Glabber was, was such a lovely freedom where it was like, no, let's just make him so despicable. There, I'm stopping many words come out of my mouth, but, <laughs> but make him unforgivable. And he was bullied and he's, you know, it's all those cliches of the, the, the bullied bullies back. And, but it was so lovely going, I do not need to put any effort into trying to ask you to like me. I would rather if you all went, you want sometimes you just want a person you want to hate them you look like you love the, to hate them kind of thing yeah. and that was exactly what the character was and and there, there are moments later on where there, there are more hateable people in the show <laughs> that that you can sort of win one up by just you know them being more hateful than you but um but it was really nice and it's 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 so it's great therapy to go to work each day and you know stab people and shout at them and crucify them and it's really good <laughs> i recommend it <laughs> Has there ever been a role that, you know, looking back, you're kind of just like, oh, dang, I really wish I'd gotten that one. one that's everyone. Like everyone. You're just part of, part of the um, – it was sort of happening beforehand, but part of COVID, um, post, during COVID and post-COVID is um, one, of the, one of the awful things um, you have to do as an actor, and you kind of at any stage of your career, you still – you know, even, even if you're – Brad Pitt, sometimes, you know, they don't, there's Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise and someone else up for the role. So, you know, even Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt lose out on stuff. I, they probably never do, but anyway, you know, so, um, but, but, you know, not Tom Cruise. But so, so you, th there's always auditioning, you always have to audition. And, and back in the day, it used to be like, you'd go into rooms with people and you'd get to know casting directors and they'd sort of know you and you go, okay, let's do it. And they were there and sometimes the director would be there and you could, you could alter it and get sort of an idea of what's needed. More and more, and what, before COVID and then post COVID, it's pretty much all self-taping. So you, you are in a hotel room or you're, you're in your own house or, and you, you know, you're sticking up a camera and you're doing your acting in your living room. It's just ridiculous. It's so awful and terrible, but and I try and do as little of it as possible, but but when you're doing that, it you spend a good two days 
you know, reading the script, getting, making choices about the character, just getting it. You, you set it all up. You have to get a friend, hopefully a, a, an actor, someone who's good to come and read with you. And so it's this process that takes a good two, three days of, of kind of going a little bit crazy. And, and it's heartbreaking because you do it. And by the time you've done that work and you've altered yourself a little bit to kind of understand the character, you love it and you really want to play it. And there are so many of those now and they just go out and you never hear another thing. And it's so those, that aspect of it is constantly heartbreaking. You know, it's not so much of like, I could have played Batman. It's just like every, every job that you wanted and you didn't get hurts a little bit because you go, huh. And sometimes you see it and, and you know, it's, they, they cast someone absolutely different to you. Sometimes you see it and they cast someone and they're just amazing. Sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a movie star. So I would cast him in everything or her in everything. But other times you do see it and go, I was so much better. God, they're crap. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it worse. It's it's just just like, oh. It does sting a little bit. <laughs> does, um, does anyone out here have... Any, I'm not, I'm not no, cutting you No, I was actually on. about to throw it out to the floor now. So if people do have questions, we have two microphones Because I just want to start myself here. talking constantly <laughs> about rubbish. Captain America. I literally just walked in here to see what was going on. Who are you exactly? <laughs> My name is Nick Tarabay, and I played Asher in <laughs> Spartacus. I was an... <laughs> Sorry, there's Thank children you. here. Anyone, ha anyone have questions for Craig Parker? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very cool outfit. Oh, hello. Hi. 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 So I was just wondering, you mentioned about the wigs and Lord of the Rings and all that stuff. Um, which you find harder, the wigs and prosthetics are like an agent's machine? <coughs> sorry. An agent's can, machine. I'm sorry, I'm going to do that. Can, sorry. Yeah. Can you do that whole sentence again? And I'm sorry. This, uh, sorry, yeah, okay. Um, just, you mentioned about the wigs and things. And yes. it's, but in terms of prosthetics, which, you find, which do you find more difficult? Being covered in paint or being covered, or just <laughs> that sort of thing? Um, I thankfully have never... I don't think I've ever had full prosthetics. Um, I've had like bits out. So we would have like ears stuck on and little bits of gluey stuff. Oh yeah. Um, and I, but I think doing full, I was talking to Nick about this earlier, like he did, just did a character with full prosthetics and it would be, I just think it would be so awful because you, you're like four hours in the makeup chair in the morning of, and having this stuff on your face. Um, and the wigs, if, if you're lucky enough to have a really good wig, they, they make it for you. So it's mapped to your own head. They, they cover you in glad wrap. Uh, do you call it glad wrap here? Uh, no. Cling film. Cling film. And so they just wrap your head in this, and then they draw headline, and they put tape over it so it becomes a solid thing. And then the, the shape is built, and then they t individually tie real hair to it. So you get these beautiful wigs that fit you, and they become really quick to put on. So a good good wig technician, makeup hair artist, they can usually do it you know, very quickly and make it look great. So I would go the wig every time. Though facial hair, always grow your own. Because mm. a fake, maybe a fake moustache, but a fake beard always looks stupid. Just looks so. Yours is real. I'm taking. I think so. Yeah. See that's a good. One. <laughs> if you ever want to sell it, let me know. We'll do. <laughs> Cheers, man. All right. Uh, actually, we'll go this side here just so we can have a one for one sort of thing going on. Um, what was your favoriteing cinnamon on rain? I, I. This is not an accent thing. It's just the reverb is funny. Can you stop? I have no idea what she's saying. Um, what was your favorite thing to film on rain? Um, every moment, um, rain, I, rain was, um, for those who haven't seen it, it's, it's the F Mary Queen of Scots married, who knew? I didn't know before it started. Um, uh, the French prince and briefly was queen of France. Who knew? Um, before he died and she came back and then got a head cut off. Stuff happened in between. Um, ruined the show for those of you who haven't seen it. But, um, it was, it was just the most divine cast to work with. And we, most of us, we shot in Toronto and most of us weren't from there. So we were all kind of tourists in a city that we just bonded together and just, I just loved that cast. So every bit was amazing. But we would, for the first couple of seasons where it was all set in France, 
every episode we would have a giant ball. There'd be a, I'm so sorry, excuse me. We'd have a big party in the castle. And so for two days we would shoot this thing and it meant the entire cast would be gathered all day and we would just get naughty. So come three o'clock, this sugar crash happens where everyone just becomes so stupid and we think we're hilarious and the crew just hate us because it's like shut up we just want to shoot no we have to giggle because this is hilarious and and we Anna Popplewell started this we started doing cheese jokes and if we would just invent cheese jokes and we would share cheese jokes and it's kind of like if you children here but apparently sometimes silly people in the past have taken big drugs and got crazy and that's how it felt at sort of 3 30 we would just become hysterical about stupid cheese jokes what did the queen say what happened to the queen when she ate too much cheese she got fatter and fatter <laughs> what did the cheese say when it looked in the mirror hello me Think about it. <laughs> now, this is a tricky one. How do you defuse a Welsh cheese bomb? Very kefilly. Does anyone get that? Oh, God bless you. Um, no one in America gets that. Okay, that's the end of it. But um, sorry, that doesn't particularly answer. But those, those actually were fun. So every episode, they had two days and just all together wearing nice frocks, being very silly. And then we do lots of you know, deep meaningful acting as well. Thank you. Those are the cheesiest jokes I've ever heard. <laughs> Next. <laughs> hey, and those jokes were chatter than any I could come up with anyway. So, um, no, but work on it. Polish that. It's going to be great. A uh, bit of a serious question here. Uh, out of all the smells mentioned tonight, what's the worst? Definitely the Guinness part. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we're over here. Hi. I just want to say I absolutely loved you and Legend of the Seeker. And uh, by the way, I did get the joke, and I'm American. So I just want to know um, how did you feel about your character in Legend of the Seeker, and did and did you enjoy portraying him? I I was an emperor in Legend of the Seeker, and it was the most fun. Um, I had a very good wig again <laughs> which, yeah, yeah, you just love a good wig <laughs> well it was it was because there were times the story got a bit convoluted because it, it started it was a series of books um that already there were 14 or so there was some ridiculous number of terry goodkind's books and abc which is disney um picked up the show rob tappet who had done xena and hercules and so they they picked up this show legend of the seeker and it was all great, but clearly no one had read the books. And the books are really kind of violent, and there's some weird kinky stuff that goes on in it. And this is ABC Disney. have gone, yeah, well, here's some money. Here's like millions. And then obviously no one in the exec world had read it. And then, you know, some, some guy in the mail pool had, you know, go read this book. Tell me what you think. Write a report. And then the report finally, like two weeks before we started shooting, got to the top going, uh, well, sir, there are the ladies who have these sticks that look like sticks and they stick them in people and it hurts them. And, and there's just, there's a whole series of weirdness. And so clear, then suddenly the, the message came down going, stop production, you shall not film. And so much had to be rewritten and various characters that were really dodgy had to be taken out. So there was a major kind of re reblast. And there were times when the story got really convoluted that even when we were shooting it, we had no idea what it, I didn't half the time. I was like, I'm not sure whether I'm, a, I'm magic, whether I'm dead, whether I'm real, whether I'm not, but I had this great wig and this really cool costume. So it was like, as long as the beginning of every shot would be as long as we do this. Get the cape just right. Business shoes, covered, just like that. Hair, get the flick right. And basically the acting took care of itself. It was just, you just let the hair and, and the frock do its business. And the magic accountant shoes underneath just sit there waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Back over here. Hello. Um, my question is, when you play a villain, do you approach them like, yeah, he's a bad guy, let's just do the bad guy? Or do you approach them as being misunderstood? I, I think 
the worst people in the world always believe that they are the best people in the world. And, and, and you get some, you know, you get some characters, I, I won't, you know, you could think of a politician perhaps who, who clearly is, knows that they are just making crap up the whole time, but they're doing it for a reason. But, but I, I, I'm, fa I'm always fascinated by those people who, they genuine, Glaber really believed he was stopping a terrorist. He really believed, and if you think about it, the, the Spartacus killed more people than Glaber did. And, um, and, and, and in, in um, Legend of the Seeker, Raal wanted to bring about a better world. You know, he, he a little bit eugenic -y Nazi by, you know, a pure world, but the, these people genuinely, I, I think, believe what they want. Um, th there's a whole other world of villain who is just the straight con man who knows that they are just taking people. But um, I, I'm always fascinated by those people. And also those people who have been screwed over by other people. And rather than it making them a better person, it's just made them a worse person. And um, so, and that was, I found fascinating with Glabber that he was like, just a disgusting little toad who'd been crapped on by everyone else. And rather than realizing, you know, maybe I can find a better way, just became toadier. And, um, and it's, it's really fun to play. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got time for just two more questions. So luckily we have two more Hellfire people. Club. T-shirt snap. I used to play D&D &D and we invented it. Do you play D&D? &D? No. How dare you wear the shirt? Anyone here play D&D? &D? Is it a thing still? Oh yeah, it had a massive research and so... Well, I, I imagine it would. With yes, hex dice. We invented a game at school. I was really cool, obviously, at school. So we had D&D, &D, obs, but then we, we made a, sh a game called KV, which was a cunning mix of humans and dinosaurs. Oh. Yeah, prehistoric game. And we also had Futura, which was set in the... It had like lasers and cool things, but still magic. Where? Sorry, your question, non D and D player. Um, I, I, um. <laughs> Don't be scared. Um, who's your favorite actor? I guess Nick Tarabay. Okay. Um, I, you know, it's it, there are so many different actors. I just think are amazing, and quite often it will be the last person I saw in something that they were really good in. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Julie, uh, uh, women, I think Julianne Moore is one of my favorite people to watch at all times. Um, not sure about men. Who's yours? Um, Does it rhyme with Greg Raka? No. Okay. <laughs> Does it rhyme with Greg Breaker? No. Is, is he even in a top 100 list? I don't even know who he is. No, oh. neither, neither do I. Um, <laughs> Last question. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Eli. Eli, thank you very nice sword, Eli. <laughs> Learn to play D and D. It's really good. You get dice that have more than six things on them. It's amazing. But you have to remember their names. It's like, oh, I use my hex attack baton. Okay, stopping. Hello. Hi. Um, what was your favorite actors to work with on the Spartacus set? And were there any funny moments? Um. I there, there are others, and 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 you know, and Lucy Lawless is just Lucy, who's amazing, and um, and a huge, huge sort of hero, someone I just adored before that show and had never met, but was um, Betty the, uh, John Hannah. Hmm? John, John Hannah. Hannah. You know, John Hannah is a god. John Hannah is one of the naughtiest people on earth, too. <laughs> so there is when you when you do live theatre. This, you know, pranks you play on each other, and sometimes one of them is like grabbing someone's belt as they're about to make an entrance from the wings, and, and it's just like, I've got to just shut up. He would do that during takes, so you would be like around a corner with him, and they're talking, and the cameras are rolling, and you have to sort of arrive, and you'd go to walk, and he would be like, I got you, I got you, you can't do it. It's like, shut up, look at the guy, and then you sort of have to walk around the corner, and go, yes, I'm a Roman. <laughs> um, so he's truly, truly a terrible man, but. <clears throat> And I'm, actually, I don't think you can hear, but I worked with Nick a lot. We became sort of um, 
not buddies, who like he was my two IC for a while in the show. And he was just, he was so great to work with. He was fantastic. And every scene with him is, he's just interesting. And he makes these choices that are so funny and so real and so good. So um, I, many, many of the others I love, but, but we spent a lot of time doing scenes together. I just loved, loved him. But I'd never tell him that to his face. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's all we have time for today. Prepare for the no! prepare for the pro contest oh, oh. coming on soon. Is Gandalf wanting to ask a question? Oh, sorry. Okay, go on. We've got time for Gandalf very quickly. You're scared of him, aren't you? It's gonna like, <laughs> Gandalf. So just one question. Uh, it's a bit of a twofer, but uh, what was it like working with on Lord of the Rings? And did you borrow? anything from the tops. <laughs> <laughs> I was going, that's a very authentic costume you've got on there, <laughs> Ian McKellen. Um, I, I, incredible to work on and, and, and to be beyond it after the fact of working on it, just to go, I got to be part of something so magnificent. But it was just fantastic to go and play on that. And the detail and the, the attention to detail with everything Everything put in your hand, everything put on you, every set you walked into, the detail was astronomical. And it was just micronomical. Um, it was incredible. And so, yeah, just beautiful. And the, the cast, delicious and wonderful. And, and that was such a privilege. And I did not take anything. My, my armor and sword and stuff, which is utterly beautiful, the pieces I didn't break. Um, so every, when you're doing a fight scene, you just hear these and go, oh, thousand bucks, thousand bucks, hair rips, oh, two thousand bucks. Um, but that all is part of, um, in some music, like it's a part of the rings traveling thing. So I, I got a pair of ears that I kept <laughs> and they're rotting some. They're probably evolved, grown into something. They're now, enough. yeah, called Cannon. That's what, <laughs> what is called Cannon? What's that about, people? Cabbage and spuds. Oh, it's weird. <laughs> what is it? Weird. Craig, thank you so much for joining thank us here today. Much. Everybody, Mr. Craig Parker. Thank you so much. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you for coming. Should I put this here?